This week on The Communicators, an insider perspective on the wireless industry with Ralph De La Vega of AT&T Mobility. This week on The Communicators, our guest is Ralph De La Vega, who is the president and CEO of AT&T's Mobile and Consumer Markets. Mr. De La Vega joins us from our studio in New York. Thank you for being with us. Mr. De La Vega, in a recent speech, you called for a fact-based dialogue with the FCC when it comes to potential regulation of the wireless industry. Why did you emphasize fact-based and what issues were you referring to specifically? Uh, well, actually, I think uh, the Chairman Janikowski said when he was going to conduct his study, it was going to be fact-based, and I think that's absolutely uh, the way to approach it. So. Uh, when the chairman and his staff visited with us at uh, CTIA in that last show in, in San Diego, uh, we, we kind of put forth uh, what I think are very compelling facts about the state of the wireless industry in this country and importantly how it compares to the rest of the world. Uh, for example, when, when you look at the wireless industry today in the U.S., the points that I made is it's the most vibrant and most competitive marketplace in the entire country, uh, not only the country, I should say, but, but the world. Uh, we made our point using facts that the U.S., uh, by any measure that you look at, whether it's a concentration index uh, like HHI that's used by the Department of Justice or just by the number of competitors that we have in this country, is the most uh, competitive market in the world and the least concentrated market in the world. So I, I wanted to, to make those points because some people have said and are still saying for a fact that maybe the industry is not competitive enough, but in the U.S. we have four national uh, wireless competitors, uh, but we also have 173 other local, regional, or specialty carriers for a total of 177. Uh, by contrast, the next nearest country has a total of 37. So uh, the U.S., whether you measure it by concentration indexes, or by just a sheer number of carriers. It's a very competitive marketplace. And the best evidence that supports those facts are the prices uh, that we charge our customers. When you look at uh, customers in the 26 developed countries of the world, the U.S. has the least cost per minute, that is we charge customers in the U.S. the least amount per minute of any of the developed countries. But not just the least amount, it's 60% less than the average. And that results in U.S. customers talking three times as much as the average of the developed world. So it highlights that competition is working, that customers are getting a good deal, and customers are getting great choices uh, in the United States. And those are the kind of facts that we shared with the chairman and, uh, and his staff. And uh, uh, I, I commend them for coming out and meeting with us and uh, listening to what the industry has to say and taking that into account as they approach some very important rules uh, for the country and for this industry. Rules such as what? Well, rules like net neutrality. Uh, that's a hot topic for the industry. Uh, it's been a, a hot topic uh, in the wireline industry for a number of years. Uh, and the FCC had uh, four primary principles that it was using to address the concerns in the wireline industry. Uh, now uh, there are groups that are proposing that that be applied to the wireless industry as well. And, and we think the wireless industry is a very competitive industry and that in the end, uh, the customers ought to make the choice uh, rather than regulation. And so we're uh, pro-open uh, networks, we're pro-net uh, neutrality, but we want to make sure we don't have burdensome regulations uh, on how people use and, and run the Internet. So, uh, Mr. De La Vega, if you are pro-network neutrality, as you say, would you be opposed to new rulemaking at the FCC? Uh, we would be opposed to placing burdensome rules on the wireless industry uh, that is an industry that is competitive, that is vibrant, uh, that is growing at five times the rate of the uh, economy of the country. Uh, so I think it would depend on how the rules are applied. But in general, we think that the industry is working very well, it's delivering very innovative products, uh, it's doing things that we don't see in other parts of the world. For example, I also mentioned uh, in using facts that today, uh, when you compare what's happening in the U.S., uh, all of the attention for wireless has turned to smartphones, and we're leading the world in the uh, deployment of smartphones and networks that allow those smartphones to work. Uh, so 
uh, facts like the fact that when you compare the U.S. and the most advanced forms of uh, third generation wireless technology, the U.S. has 40 percent of the world's customers in those advanced technologies such as EVDO and HSPA, which are the most advanced forms of 3G technology, when we only have 7 percent of the world's customers. So it highlights that uh, the wireless industry today is working well, it's competitive, it's delivering great value, great choices, it's got the, the latest technology that customers are enjoying. So before we go and put burdensome regulations, we should be thoughtful and very careful and uh, we should have lots of discussion about it. And I think that the, uh, the chairman, to his credit, is seeking uh, input from all sources and I'm sure we'll come out with some rulings uh, that will address those concerns, uh, not just ours, but others in the industry as well. Paul Kirby of Telecommunications Reports is here joining in the questioning. Thank you. Uh, Mr. De La Vega, Hello, thank you. Um, regarding net neutrality, the chairman has made a point of saying, really stressed the point that uh, the FCC will realize that wireless and wireline networks are different, they're technologically different. And so in, in adopting its rules, it will realize that. So as long as it realizes that, why is it a bad thing that it applies those rules to the wireless sector? I, I think that's a, that's a great uh, and an important recognition point. It's a point that, that I personally made with the chairman and his staff, and I'm glad he recognizes it. Uh, what, what it says to me is that uh, we should be thoughtful about how we apply them to wireless. Uh, it is different. Spectrum is limited uh, in wireless, and so we should be thoughtful about putting rules in place that encourage people to conserve this very valuable resource, which is what Spectrum is. And so uh, those kind of details, you know, there's always the, the devil is in the detail of what comes out. But just the fact that uh, there's that recognition is encouraging on part of the commission. But I, I think until we see the final rulings, we won't be able to tell whether we have any concerns about it or not. On, on another topic that's gotten a lot of uh, attention, and the chairman talked about this in his speech at the CTIA show, and that's spectrum allocations. Um, CTIA has said that the government should allocate an additional 800 megahertz of spectrum over the next six years. Some have questioned whether you'll really need that much. Can you give us a sense for why you think you'll need that much spectrum? Yeah, what, what we're seeing, Paul, is, is just uh, a data explosion, a data revolution like we have never seen. And by the way, that revolution is starting right here in this country. I'd say today that the U.S. is the epicenter of the next wave, the next revolution in wireless. And what we're seeing is, is, quite frankly, just customers using data on these wireless devices like we never anticipated. They're using it in record numbers. Uh, just at AT&T, we've seen a 5,000 percent increase uh, in data usage over the last several years. So it's on a very dramatic upramp. Uh, when you think through it, though, here's the reason why. When, when you use your phone only for voice, you can really actually only talk for so much during the day. But when you use it for data, you can consume a significant amount of data depending on the applications that you're using, which require more spectrum. But what we see is customers using the devices to, uh, to view streaming video, to look at uh, videos, uh, to play music uh, around the clock. And so those are applications that are consuming significantly more data uh, than we had with prior devices. And I think it's going to require more spectrum uh, to be cleared so that those applications can continue to thrive uh, in our competitive environment. Mr. De La Vega, do you agree with FCC Chairman Jenikowski that there is an upcoming spectrum crisis? Uh, I, think, uh, I think there's absolutely uh, the need for uh, more spectrum uh, and I think we need to do it quickly. And I think the Chairman said crisis because uh, it takes a long time uh, to clear spectrum. Our history has shown that even in the 700 megahertz uh, spectrum, which was just auction, uh, it took many, many years uh, to clear the spectrum. And so uh, I think uh, there's a sense of urgency simply not just because of the spectrum, but how long it takes to clear the spectrum and put it into action. So I think I totally agree with the chairman uh, that there needs to be a sense of urgency about doing this and doing it quickly. To, to drill down a bit on which spectrum, the FCC right now is, is talking about uh, perhaps reallocating broadcast spectrum. Um, DOD and other military spectrums certainly will be looked at at some point, either by the FCC or, or other agencies. Can you give us a sense for, politically, do broadcasters have enough friends in Congress to prevent that, and, and how difficult politically will it be to, to get DOD spectrum? Uh, I think any time that uh, you try to reallocate spectrum, it's very controversial. I think, uh, given where we are, it's going to take some leadership on part of the FCC and the current administration. Uh, to make the wisest decision. We're going to give uh, them the input, but I think 
uh, they have to balance uh, the, the various constituencies uh, to be able to give us what we think would be the best and also the quickest path to some additional spectrum. The, and another topic that, that has gotten a lot of attention lately, and that's distracted driving. Uh, CTI right now says that they're neutral on, on rules banning um, talking while driving and that they favor bans on manual texting. Um, that's a change in position on the, on the talking while driving. I wanted to get your, I guess your input, is, is that change, do you think, because um, the PR was getting so bad for the industry and they realized that they needed to kind of get on the right side of it? Uh, I, I've encouraged uh, CTIA as uh, incoming chair uh, to take the issue of uh, texting and driving, and driving and make it a top priority to go out uh, and be aggressive about communicating the fact that uh, we don't want people texting and driving uh, and to get a campaign that is proactive rather than reactive. And I think you've seen the CTIA and its member companies uh, take up that flag. I think that uh, we don't want our young people texting and driving and we're very supportive of uh, any effort, uh, including all education efforts, to make sure people understand that uh, we don't want our young people doing that. And, and we should just note sure. that uh, Ralph De La Vega is the incoming chairman of the CTIA, which is the Wireless Association. Go ahead, Mr. Kirby. And as far as the... Yeah, let, let yeah. me... Uh, I, wanted, sure. I wanted to add one more point so you understand kind of what, what our thinking is. Uh, at AT&T, we ourselves have taken a policy that uh, we don't want our employees uh, driving and texting. Uh, and, and so uh, it is best practices like that uh, that we're encouraging all of the CTI companies to take up certain standards where we don't only talk to our customers, but we also enforce those policies uh, with our own employees. And so we, we want to be able to walk the talk, and that is to say we, we've got to stop that doing, doing that ourselves and our employees and set the example for the rest of the industry uh, to stop uh, a tactic that I think is not... Uh, it's not safe for our young people, especially. Now, but some safety groups and people who have, have lost relatives talk about the t cognitive impacts and researchers of talking while driving. The CTI right now is neutral on that. Is that something you think the industry should come out against as well and say people shouldn't talk while driving, even if it's on a hands-free device, because of the cognitive distraction? Yeah, I think that one is a little more controversial. You know, people uh, uh, think that uh, that provides a great value in some cases. so. I think we've taken the position of letting the customer decide, looking at all the relevant information, uh, being transparent about that, and, and letting the customer make that decision. But when it comes to texting, I think that's a very clear case that uh, that's just way too much distraction, and uh, we don't want people to do that. Mr. De La Vega, if we could return to net neutrality for just a minute, I just want to ask, with regard to the spectrum that AT&T recently purchased, what would happen if that spectrum fell under net neutrality proposed rules? Well, that's a very interesting question and, and somewhat uh, you know, complex. But when we bid on the spectrum uh, at the time of the 700 megahertz auction, uh, there were two classes of spectrum. One that was uh, the, uh, the, the, the open access uh, uh, C block spectrum. And, and we purposely bid on a section of the spectrum uh, that didn't have those requirements. I think the FCC, in its wisdom at the time, uh, set up that, uh, that block that had the open access requirements as a test to see how the industry would deal with open access requirements. Uh, we actually bid a higher price because of the uncertainty about what those requirements would mean. We wanted to make sure that we could run our business as we have been accustomed to doing. Uh, now, uh, subsequent to, uh, to that, uh, that auction, and even before the spectrum is put into place, there appears to be a change in the rules. Uh, I say appear because, you know, we have not seen the final rules. And so I'm, I'm being cautious to say it, it, it appears to be, but if in fact we have to uh, abide by rules that we purposely tried to avoid and in fact bid a higher price, uh, to me that throws into question, you know, uh, how we can guarantee in future auctions that when we invest money in spectrum, uh, we can be guaranteed that uh, the rules are not going to change after we started to play the game. And so it's a very concerning issue to us. Uh, we think that a more reasonable approach uh, may be if the commission in its wisdom decides uh, to go forward with the concept of uh, the, the C block having the open access requirements and letting that play out in the marketplace and, and letting the marketplace decide uh, whether that approach is better than the traditional approach. Uh, and I think it's, uh, quite frankly, not all that different than some of the uh, stalking horses that are being proposed 
uh, in the healthcare area. So I think that may be, there may be an alternate uh, model here that can accomplish what the commission wants and yet guarantee that those people who bid, and by the way, the bids totaled 19 billion, so it's not an insignificant amount of money that was spent in that auction, uh, can be guaranteed that the auctions, uh, the rules under which the auctions were, were held uh, are gonna be retained uh, in the future. Uh, this is C-SPAN's Communicators Program. Our guest is Ralph De La Vega, who is President and CEO of AT&T Mobility and Consumer Markets. Paul Kirby of Telecommunications Reports is our guest reporter. Mr. De La Vega, if you would just take a minute and give us your background. It's a rather interesting background. So if you would just give us your professional and personal background, and you've also just authored a book. Yes, um, uh, thank you for mentioning that. I just uh, authored a book called uh, Obstacle, Obstacles Welcome, and uh, it, it chronicles uh, uh, my life from the time that I left uh, Cuba at the age of uh, 10 years old. Uh, it, it was probably the most dramatic point in my entire life when uh, my family, uh, because of uh, you know, opportunity and the persecution that they felt was in Cuba at the time as a result of the revolution, uh, decided to leave Cuba. Uh, you can imagine how difficult it is to leave your native country. You can imagine how difficult it, they had to, uh, to feel the situation was to leave all your material possessions behind and move to another country uh, to get freedom, uh, that, an opportunity that you felt would be lacking in your own. Except that when we got to the airport, uh, uh, my parents were told that at that point in time, only my papers were correct, uh, that only I could leave that day and the family had to make a choice. Uh, we could all stay behind or they could send me ahead and then follow uh, later when the papers were straightened out. Uh, my father made a very courageous decision to send me ahead. Uh, he called some friends of the family and told them to look after me, uh, that it was gonna be like a sleepover. They would be uh, following soon thereafter. Uh, and then it would be uh, four years later before I would ever see my parents. So uh, I came to the US at the age of 10 uh, by myself without speaking the language, without any family here and uh, those were difficult times. I was very, um, very thankful that a, a couple took me in, the Bias family, also uh, immigrants here, and raised me as their own child. But uh, uh, ever since then, uh, everything in my life uh, was easy uh, relative to that. And so I, I tell people that sometimes uh, the obstacles that you face are opportunities in disguise because in those early days, I really thought that what happened to me uh, was somehow a punishment. I, I couldn't understand why all my friends were with their families that had things that I was used to, and I was in a new country, couldn't speak the language, didn't know the people I was with, and, and at the end it turned out that I wouldn't have changed a thing uh, about leaving that day. I think it made me the person that I am today. I realized that yes, I was in a difficult situation, but my God, I was in the greatest country in the world with a wonderful set of people who were taking care of me, and so uh, my, um, my theme in the book is that inside every obstacle, there is opportunity. If you look for it and if you seize it, uh, the future is yours. And Mr. De La Vega has worked at Bell South, president of the broadband and internet services there. He was chief operating officer for a while at Singular Wireless and has been with AT&T since 2000 and 2007, I believe it is. Mr. Kirby, next question. Uh, another consumer issue, early termination fees are starting to get more attention in Washington. Verizon Wireless, your chief competitor, recently announced that it would raise their ETFs on advanced devices. Um, is AT&T thinking of doing that, and is there a concern that um, kind of the growing uh, momentum might result in legislation or regulations on ETFs? Yeah, we, uh, Paul, we currently have no plans to raise ETF fees. Uh, I understand uh, that Verizon has done so, and I also understand that there's been a bill introduced. Uh, I think that in cases like this, I always think that it's best to let uh, the free enterprise system and the marketplace play out rather than uh, immediately react with regulation. And so you're going to find me to be a proponent of uh, letting uh, customers have choices, uh, choices of devices, choices of service plans, and even choices of ETFs if that's what they would like but let's let the customers choose rather than burden uh, the industry with additional regulation. Mr. De La Vega, how much time do you spend lobbying in Washington or working with uh, uh, the Congress or the FCC? Uh, I, uh, I actually don't spend a lot of time lobbying, but I do respond to their requests for, uh, for information. I find that uh, the, uh, the, the, the new FCC administration has really impressed me with how they're reaching out to various constituencies 
And uh, when they ask for comments or they give us an opportunity uh, to tell our story, I, I don't hesitate to do it. Uh, but uh, I don't spend a lot of time there. We have people uh, on the Hill and in D.C. that uh, do a lot of that work for us. But whenever I am asked and they want to talk with me personally, I'm always glad to do it because I think it's an important function of the process that we're in to make sure that uh, the people on the Hill hear from our perspective directly. On another issue, roaming. Roaming is a, a key issue in the industry. It, it allows uh, the subscribers of one carrier to use basically another network when they're in an area that their carrier doesn't have service in. It's getting increased attention uh, at the FCC as well. AT&T and Verizon are on one side saying the, the current rules are okay, they don't need to be modified. The smaller national carriers and regional and rural carriers want them modified. Can you give us a sense for why you, you don't think they should be modified? Well, our, our point of view in roaming is we're not opposed to roaming, and, and uh, we would glad, uh, gladly do uh, roaming deals with, uh, with carriers. But what we don't want to do uh, is incent a carrier uh, to use our network instead of building out their own. So we, 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 we clearly, uh, it's not an issue of, uh, of wanting to do it. And I think most carriers, uh, at least the ones that I've spoken to, uh, want to use roaming for their customers when they leave out of region as opposed to on a resale basis. I think if we're not careful and set uh, burdensome regulations or dictate pricings, it could lead to uh, a, a disincentive uh, for companies to invest uh, on spectrum that they hold. So I think it's a fine balance of making sure that, that we do have roaming, uh, but that the rates are such that they don't encourage uh, certain companies uh, to not build out, not invest, not improve their networks, uh, and just uh, use very low rates uh, to the detriment of others. And so on. if we have a fair and a balanced approach to roaming, I'm very supportive of roaming. And we have many roaming agreements with, uh, with uh, our, uh, our partners throughout the country. Mr. De La Vega, when we spoke with uh, Chairman Julius Janikowski a few weeks ago on this program, we talked with him about Universal Service Fund. We want to play a little bit of that interview and get your reaction to what he said about USF. The, the bad news is the program uh, is um, uh, struggling given the changes in the marketplace. Uh, uh, as uh, uh, the contribution base for the program shrinks, uh, there are other issues that are creating stresses on the program, and there's a wide uh, group, uh, bipartisan, that has sought reform of the Universal Service Fund for quite some time. The last element of the program that needs reform is that, as you said, it's targeted at the kind of communication service that we had when we were growing up, ordinary telephones, still, of course, very important. But what we need to do is reorient the Universal Service Fund to support the next generation of communication services, broadband. Uh, that's something that's widely recognized as desirable. There are a lot of hard questions in figuring out how we get from here to there. It's something we'll be looking at as part of our broadband uh, plan. It's going to take a while to devise a way to reform universal service and to implement it, but there's widespread agreement that we need to reorient uh, the universal service fund to broadband uh, for the, our communications infrastructure in the 21st century. Mr. De La Vega. Yes, I, I think that reorienting the fund to broadband is a fundamentally correct thing. Uh, I think uh, our focus would be uh, to direct those funds to unserved areas, areas where uh, people don't currently have uh, broadband, uh, and, and, and we actually are working with uh, CTIA and our partner companies to figure out if there's a way that we can attack those areas, not just on a wireline basis, but with creative wireless approaches uh, so we can make sure that uh, every American can have access to broadband one way or the other. Would you see that as an additional tax at all? Uh, I don't view that as an additional tax, no. Paul Kirby. Um, on the legislative front, um, Congress has talked about and Congressman Boucher is expected to introduce a national framework bill that would say, uh, that would regulate wireless services at the national level instead of each state. Can you give us a sense for how likely the, the wireless industry supports this? You think something like that will be the, to actually get through? And what, what role is there for states to actually enforce such legislation? Yeah, that, I know that uh, that is uh, that's been ongoing for a while. I think what we're hearing is that uh, you know there's other more pressing issues right now, uh, but that uh, something likely could happen uh, sometime next year. Uh, we have been supporting uh, a national framework in order to move some issues 
uh, to the national level and to get them uh, expedited. Uh, but we're, uh, we're fairly flexible in, in how to deal with the different viewpoints on that. So uh, we, we think it should be a national framework, uh, and I think a national framework will help the industry in general. Uh, but when you put legislation forward, sometimes you really don't know what finally comes out. So we're going to wait and see what the final bill looks like before we decide uh, how much we want to support it. And finally, Mr. De La Vega, we got about two minutes left. We can't talk to AT&T Mobile without talking about the iPhone. Uh, when does your agreement with Apple end, <laughs> and uh, would you like that agreement to continue? Uh, we, uh, we don't comment on when the agreement ends. Uh, we're under NDA not, not to do that, but we're very happy uh, with, the, uh, with the agreement. Apple is a great company. The iPhone is just uh, the best device out there and uh, we're glad for it to continue as, as long as possible. So we're very happy with the relationship and uh, it's bore fruit for both uh, Apple and AT&T. Verizon and um, AT&T recently dropped lawsuits against each other over the advertising, um, Verizon and AT&T's advertising. Can you tell us why the two companies decided to do that? Yeah, I think that rather than fight the issues in the courts, uh, I think we'd rather fight it in the court of public opinion. So I think uh, it was a good idea to uh, put the legal uh, weapons down and just uh, talk to our customers, uh, get them the facts, uh, and in the end, uh, let the uh, customers uh, make the choice. Mr. De La Vega, the broadband deployment plan is due in February of next year. Uh, AT&T is running commercials saying they support broadband deployment. Are you supporting what the government is doing right now to roll out broadband nationwide? I tell you, we have seen some of the work, uh, the early work that the task force has done, uh, and it has been excellent. Uh, I've seen the presentations, I've looked at them. Uh, I think it's very detailed, very well thought out, and we're very encouraged by the early efforts. Uh, the, it's, it may seem like a long time, but February will be right around the corner. We hope that the final product will be every bit as good as what we've seen so far. But we're very encouraged about the great work that's being done in this area. Is AT&T been applying for some of the grants or taking some of the government money to help roll out uh, the no, broadband? No, we, we have not applied uh, for uh, the government money at this time. Paul Kirby, final question. Uh, last question. How difficult, you're chairman of CTI this year, how difficult it is, is it to bridge the various views of members? Typically large members, medium sized and smaller members, particularly carriers, have to have views on issues. Sometimes CTI will just stay away from an issue. Can you address that since you're chairman this year? Yeah, absolutely, Paul. That is a great question. Uh, one of my, my goals for uh, the incoming year for CTIA is to reach out to all members of CTIA uh, to make sure that we focus on the things that unite us and not the things that divide us. And when you look at all the issues that we have in common for the good of the, uh, of the group and for the good of the industry, we have many more issues that unite us than divide us. So you're going to see me reach out to rural carriers, to new carriers, and make sure that we act as one CTIA uh, moving forward and addressing the key issues that are facing this industry, which is such a critical industry uh, uh, to, the, to the country. And so you're going to see me uh, be reaching out. I've already done so uh, to our members and asking us to be more united. Uh, I think the more united we are, the more effective we're going to be able to, uh, to operate. Ralph De La Vega. President and CEO of AT&T Mobile and Consumer Markets. Thank you for being our guest on The Communicators. Paul Kirby, Telecommunications Reports, has been our guest reporter.